All right, we are live. So I wanted to take a minute and check in via chat, see who's available to hang out and uh, see if there's any questions, thoughts or whatnot about Columbia. And so as we wait, looks like there's one person tuning in thus far. But um, today I had a chance to speak with another real estate person as well as I stopped and spoke with a young lady on the corner of Venezuelan to get more of her take. So I'm interviewing okay. everybody. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so with that being the case, I want to check in and see who's available, see who wants to chit chat back and forth a little bit. And, uh, there were some questions in the comment section of the videos that I haven't been able to answer. Okay. But hopefully today people can ask those questions sure. uh, directly to us and or you or whatever. And uh, so, so far we got Spirit King, we got Krispy Kreme, we got Excalibur. So I appreciate everybody taking time to hang out with us. And um, I'll go from there, but uh, we got Excalibur says, so let's go. We got Adius so, now. Um, so yeah, so with that being the case, watch it. Too much audio. All right, so with that being the case, um, I want to share some of my thoughts on my experiences thus far in Medellin, and then also, because Mr. George lives here, yeah. it'd be a lot easier to get any serious well, questions. I spend a lot of time here. Yeah. I don't like to say I live anywhere. anywhere. I just kind of go with the flow, but I like to spend a lot yeah, that's good, man. Let me move this up so we get more center. Okay, so with that being the case, uh, here's an interesting question from Mr. Jeff. It says, can U.S. citizens buy property in Columbia, no strings attached? Yes. Yes. Easy question. <laughs> Easy question. So if you want a little bit more specific answer, go a little deeper. <laughs> um, it's it. Well, let me, I'll, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to to just give you a real short answer. But uh, yes, they absolutely can. The property rights here. I think are actually a little bit stronger even in the United States because in the U.S. you always have a lien against your property in the form of property taxes. So even if you think you own your property outright, you really don't because the government just tried not paying your property taxes for a couple of years. And here, although they do have property taxes, the laws aren't nearly as draconian if you don't uh, keep up on those payments. So it's a very similar process here. We've got a notary and you use a lawyer instead of using a title company, mm -hmm. but uh, it takes about the same amount of, actually it's a little faster here. If you've got a, a counterparty that's really ready to go, you can get it done faster here. Uh, the commissions are, uh, and the fees are pretty much the same. So very similar process to the US. Yeah, so someone says, unlike in Mexico, or Jeff said, yeah. unlike in Mexico. Yeah, because there's this 99 year lease. So you really can't own the property. Yeah. You just get a, a 99 year lease on it. A couple generations worth. Yeah, I haven't done a lot of homework on that, so I'm not too familiar with how that works. Mm -hmm. Because typically, well, not typically, all the time, you know, when I look at real estate across the world, that's kind of one of my first uh, things that I look for is to make sure that you can own the property. Mm -hmm. Good stuff there. So as always, if you guys have anything you want to share with us, also, uh, might as well because I haven't been staying in touch much with the mainstream news, apart from just being in the Medellin. And, and unless you go looking for it, you're not going to necessarily find it. I haven't watched some, I haven't attempted to cut on any type of TV to watch no news here, so I don't know what's going on here. I so, like to ignore it. So. You ignore it? Yeah. Is I it? Even, it's not that I don't watch it. I completely ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's real. Keep yourself from, from panicking a lot. So Jeff says, how much is property taxes? 1%? Yeah, about 1%. 1%, good stuff. Uh, what else we got here? So Mia says hello. So um, in talking with Ryan, he mentioned about um, uh, for U.S. citizens staying here longer than 180 days, there is a um, certain tax, tier level tax system, whatever. Can you elaborate on that more, if you don't mind? Yeah, you just, you just become a tax resident yeah. of Columbia. So it doesn't mean that you pay any additional taxes. You just have to, uh, you would if the tax rate in Columbia was higher. Mm -hmm. Than the tax rate in the United States, but it's, I don't think it is. Yeah. yeah. In fact, with capital gains, it's a little lower. It's yeah. only 10% um, long term capital gains. But so, how that works is if you're a tax resident, and this is with most countries, if you're a tax resident of that country, you're there more than 100 and you know, half the year, mm -hmm. then you pay your taxes to that country first. Mm -hmm. This is income taxes yeah. or capital gains. And then you would take that and use that as a credit against the taxes that you owe in the United States. Yeah. So that's why if there's, you know, if, if your tax rate here is let's say 30% and in the US it's 35%, well you pay the taxes here first mm -hmm. 
and then you get a credit and you pay an additional 5% in the US. Mm -hmm. The only place where US citizens legally do not pay US taxes is in, uh, if they're a resident of Puerto Rico. So you'd have to look into it, which I, I, I went through that process in 2014. It's Act 20 and 22, uh, which is what you can look up if you're kind of looking for um, ways to lower your tax burden uh, as a U.S. citizen. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Puerto Rico. So I know a lot of people in, in the crypto space is very excited about the new uh, new laws and things that put in place for digital nomads, a.k.a. crypto people. So yeah, that they're referring to Act 2022. Act 2022. Yeah. All right. So there's a question from Spirit King. He says, is it safe to store gold and silver in Colombia? From theft to government stability, what are the risks? Well, I think the risks of storing gold here in your back pocket are just the same as the United States. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a, an increase of risk here. I, I actually I'd go even further. I'd say it's a, probably a little lower here. It depends on where you live. You know, if you have a, excuse me, like if you're in a super secure high rise building in the United States with it's got a lot of security coming to the front door. I actually lived in a place I recall in, in Phoenix. It was right at the right by the Biltmore. Mm -hmm. And first of all, you had to go through the doorman. Then you had to go through the security guard. Then once you got on the elevator, mm -hmm. you had to put your thumbprint on the elevator mm -hmm. and it would only go to your floor. Mm -hmm. That's it. So if you're living in a place like that, I think I think you're pretty good. Uh, if you're just keeping it in your, a safe in your house or something yeah. like that. But I don't think there's any greater or less risk here. Yeah. Someone says, can I become a citizen in Colombia? Yes, you can. You can do dual citizenship So uh, with the U.S. And I suggest that I'm on that path myself. I had Sebastian, who's my assistant, um, get uh, a, an investment visa. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he got me an investment visa. And then it's either three years or five years, I'm not sure which, but then I'll have the opportunity to um, apply for citizenship and get an actual second passport. Sweet, nice. Dual citizenship is, I think dual citizenship, a lot of, I mean, a lot of people have interviewed Leo Gantz and even uh, with Doug Casey, talking about, you know, they, everyone mentioned about get out, get start working on your citizenship, try to get a second passport, da da da, whatever. And, Jeff Burick specializes in places and countries where it's the easiest. You know, of course, you know, the more you can contribute to that country, the faster and the easier the process will be. So that's something worth you know looking into. But not everyone will be able to do that. So yeah, that's right. Even just for the average Joe, what I suggest doing is just next time you got a two week vacation, you know, take a week and go to a country that you think you might like to spend time if you didn't like what was going on in the United States or whatever your home country is. And then when you're there, maybe try to set up a bank account, go back home and just, just take baby steps. Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, people think, see it as like a binary decision. Mm -hmm. either, either you do everything in the United States or you do everything outside. If you can't do everything outside, well then just forget it. I'm not even gonna think about it. <laughs> but you know, just take it, do a week, set up a bank account, put a couple grand down there. Uh, just kind of get a feel for how it works mm -hmm. and then if in the if maybe next year's vacation go back down maybe look at some property and just kind of take it and yeah. as a gradual progression yes. start sowing some seeds there early yeah for sure okay for sure. interesting so here ernesto from puerto rico says hi guys i'm in, i'm from puerto rico actually a quake 5.3 just hit us it's shaking a lot here that's oh, unfortunate man. oh that's nothing that, that happens all the time puerto rico, puerto rico. <laughs> Ernesto, by the way, I I, I, I lived, uh, I was in uh, San Juan, of course. I had a place at uh, Isla Verde, right by the um, the El San Juan Hotel, that old school casino hotel. A yeah. really, really neat place. I enjoyed that. Uh, it's been time. Yeah. Nice. Uh, it says Code NBIA, not Colombia. 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 Okay. Keep it going. <laughs> It says, thanks, my friend. We're not used to quakes here, but but people is aware. Okay. Sounds good. Interesting. So um, the Venezuela situation. So as I mentioned earlier, Venezuela being so close to this country, um, I was telling Ryan earlier, one of my concerns would be if, if things aren't solved there or 
that there's no solution to that problem, then I can imagine more Venezuelans coming to Colombia to the point where they're going to have to close borders or figure out some type of way where it doesn't impact their economy a lot. And so do you foresee something of that nature happening? Possibly. Because I mean, a lot of people are taking, are not, a lot of people are benefiting as far as creating jobs for Venezuelans and whatnot. So there's, a, there's opportunity for people to get into the economy here. But then again, outside, there's so many people that's not in the main economy, but they are in the form of begging. But that's more of a burden on the country, I think so. Yeah, I, I don't know that it could get much worse. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the Venezuela situation, mm -hmm. and what could they do to, to make it worse? So I think that, and since it's been going on so long, mm -hmm. you know, if it was something that had been going on for like two weeks or a couple months, mm -hmm. I would see uh, there could possibly be a lot more inflow. Yeah. But it's been going on for five, six years. So it's been getting progressively worse. But over the last two years, I mean, it's just been a living hell yeah. there. So I think all the people that are going to leave the country probably have already left. I, I don't know how much worse it could get, but I don't think it's a huge burden. It's 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 um it's um yeah, I don't know on the economy if it's a big burden because I don't know how their social welfare mm -hmm. system works. It was like the United States where, yeah, it, it, it could potentially be really uh, have some downside there. Yeah. But um, I don't, I would assume that it doesn't really work that way here. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just, it's, it's very unfortunate. I'm glad that they can come over mm -hmm. and just get some reprieve from the, the nightmare that they have to deal with over there. I mean, I've got a lot of fantastic Venezuelan people working for me mm -hmm. and um, they're, it's, it's, it's great that they've got some release now. Yeah, that's good. So there's a question for Ernesto. He says, I have a question. Here in Puerto Rico, we do not have to pay for capital gains, but it's necessary to let the government know. Yeah. But is it necessary to let the government know? Yeah, you're always going to have to file U.S. taxes. Um, well, well, actually, I take that back. I, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to say yes or no there because I don't know the answer. You want to check with a, a CPA, and not just a CPA, but one that really understands what's going on in Puerto Rico. Very few of them do. But uh, the, the bottom line is, uh, for specific cap gains, they're at zero, and your max on business revenue, certain business revenues, well, there's stipulations that has to be Puerto Rican sourced and whatnot. But uh, that max is out at four percent. Yeah, sounds good. And so, um, what else is going on? So, uh, okay, so. One thing that I talked about yesterday was the Wuhan virus. And so I'm, I'm gonna be, it's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out in the next couple of weeks, months, whatever. And will there be many cases down in this region? As far as like, and I think as I can go conspiratorial out of mind, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's a strategically placed or strategically, uh, I'm trying to lose, lose my train of thought. Virus put in certain places that are involved in all the current economic issues we're having. So France has had a case, U.S. has a couple of cases, China has some cases. So it might end up being a virus limited to just G7 type nations to spur on some type of, as I mentioned last night, about some joint effort to unite. And it'll be easier to get governments to say, OK, they can pass some type of law that say, we want to now join forces as a team. We need that, you know, the one world government type of yeah, type it's of thing. It's always for your security, right? So whatever. So that's what I'm. I'm curious to find out. But you know, what are your thoughts on that? Of course, you haven't. You know, you don't, I haven't heard nothing about it out here yet. But is that something that concerns you? And is it something that could possibly be strategically have been strategically done to help cover up or push the can down the road a little bit more as far as debt expansion things like that? Well, I think anything is possible. That's for sure. I'm not sure what the probabilities are because I, I don't get into the weeds on that stuff too much. Mm -hmm. But I, I I would say that it, if it if it is a, a conspiracy thing, if you, if you go down that path, I would prefer to be in a country that was really off the radar, mm -hmm. like Colombia or like Montenegro. Would be fantastic because there's only six hundred thousand people in the whole country, mm -hmm. and and you're very very isolated. So. Um, but, and if it's not conspiratorial, then I would also prefer to be in a country like this because you've got a lot fewer people traveling to the 
epicenter you know, of where this thing is uh, is originating. So, you know, if you if you live in Montenegro, how many Montenegrins are traveling over to China or Hong Kong? You know, probably, <laughs> probably not too many. <laughs> so, uh, there, I think there is some upside there, regardless of which um, you know what the the catalyst to this is. Mm-hmm. All right, so. Um, so this is just live talk. So I ran. So that's why there's no there's no order. There's no there's nothing to this. So uh, if you guys have questions, feel free to ask. And so I'll start throwing out some questions just because I'll make this like an interview style. Sure. And so um, what was I going to say about Columbia? Some of the real estate properties you showed us, and some some people got a chance to see the sneak pre- sneak previews. The comments was some of the comments was spending a hundred. 30, 150,000 for a apartment. And then, of course, from an investment standpoint, it's the equivalent of a house, but I am not familiar with, but having an apartment as opposed to a house, are there any downsides to that? Or because the, it's in a building, so what's is there any downsides to that? I think the downsides are far outweighed by the upside. Mm-hmm. And so first and foremost, I think most people, most Americans seeing it, uh, the way that people live in Medellin, and it's not like this in all of Columbia, but Medellin is down in a very steep valley, as, as, as Mike knows, mm-hmm. and it's a very narrow valley. So the only way you can build is up. So 99%, I mean, have you seen a house? I have not. <laughs> yeah, Everything's so, connected. So, yeah. That's my point. So <laughs> 99% of housing here is in high-rise apartment buildings. So. That, that is just where everyone lives. It's not like the U.S. where you kind of live in an apartment. It's like, ah, that's kind of, it's maybe kind of frowned upon a little bit. Yeah. It, you know, you don't have your own space. It, it's kind of seen like that. We're here. It's just, that's where everyone lives. Same thing in Singapore. But my point is that the downside is going to be you've got HOA dues. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at this from strictly a number standpoint, looking at it as a, a rental property. Yeah. Uh, association fees. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the admin fees. So, but they're, they're reasonable. I think on this this place where we're in right now, that this is about 1,700 square feet. This is in the nicest area of town. It's going to be the, the you're not going to have to pay any more than you would for this apartment. I think I maybe pay uh, 150 bucks, mm-hmm. you know, 200 bucks, something like that based on the conversion. Now, your upside is going to be that you have zero maintenance costs. So I own rental properties in the United States, and I know what can go wrong. You can have a roof go out. You can have a foundation crack that you have to fix. I mean, those are five thousand dollar problems right there. You can have a hot water, or you can have your HVAC blow out. You know, there's a lot of things that you got your uh, landscaping. If a renter moves out, you you've got to spend a thousand bucks minimum to get the place ready for the for the next renter. There's a lot of costs involved yeah. that you just don't have here. You, 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 obviously, you're not going to have a roof issue. You're not going to have a foundation issue. The the walls, uh, I can't really point. There we go. Like these walls, guys, that just, <laughs> I can't, there you go, pointing. Um, and the ceiling, for that matter. Here, in, it's all concrete. It's all concrete and brick. So you're, it, it's, it's much harder to, you know, you can't punch a hole in the wall yeah. <laughs> in, in a brick wall like a renter could in like a drywall. So because of the fact that you don't have a roof, you don't have all those major issues, and the fact that if you do have a renter in there, they, they, they can't really do much damage, mm-hmm. and it's all tile floors, and these are polished concrete. So that kind of well, definitely outweighs the, the, the downside of having the cost of the HA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so... Uh, precious metal places. So I did a little research yesterday, trying to find something near me, and I only can in Google search from company or any type of reputable companies. There's nothing popped up, and so there's one place about three miles away, which I wasn't after doing a Google map to see the area. I wasn't going to that area, so I'm like, that's not a place that uh, it was a rare coin place. But um, in talking with Ryan, he mentioned that um, what's really big here is emeralds. And so, of course, gold mining and, and, and mining for emeralds are is really big here. Mm-hmm. And so that's something that you know I didn't know until today, of which I you know, definitely want to, I want to find out more about. So, um, yeah, it's going to be something worthwhile. Yeah, the, the gold is is not really that popular in South America mm-hmm. as like it is in Asia or other parts of the world as far as just being a store of value. Mm-hmm. Here, it's really real estate. Yeah. Yeah. People see real estate as that as in the same way that people in the East. See gold. Yeah. 
And so that, and to hit on that further, we we're talking about uh, safe haven assets for people in this region is in real estate. And so when your currency, when you can't trust your currency, you get rid of it into something tangible in the form of real estate because they don't have access primarily to gold and silver the way we do in the States. So that's something that's uh, probably, probably in every country within this continent in this region here that has had some currency issues. People yeah. probably flood right into real estate. So yeah, that's just your go-to uh, that sort. And to, to take it a step further, when I was in Ecuador, when I met Angie Joaquin, um, I was in a town of maybe a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And each, there was one main highway that went up and down the coastline. Mm -hmm. And every two miles, there'd be a little fishing village. Yeah. And they'd build their little structures, you know, the houses. And literally what they do is every time they, they earn an additional $5,000, mm -hmm. they just add another piece to their house. So just can, literally, just continue to build up <laughs> another room, another portion. They extend out on their property. They just keep building and building and building. So their their house is literally their their savings account and a hundred percent of their net worth. Yeah. So what I've noticed is, like, especially in Argentina, you always I, I, would, I would always see a lot of buildings with just a st still still beams sticking up in anticipation of having it or wanting to build something pretty soon. Well, that, that, okay. So that might be a little different. What, what that usually is, at least it is in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the gringos would come down and say, Oh, everything looks unfinished. It looks, it, this looks terrible. Uh -huh. But they don't realize the reason they do that is because in Ecuador, if, if the building isn't finished, mm -hmm. you don't have to pay property taxes really? or there's a big break on the property taxes. So they just leave their buildings unfinished yeah. just to get around the property tax. <laughs> change the set, change the update. Yeah. Oh man, best emeralds are out of Columbia. Um, you see, what central banks hold the yuan as reserves? Um, do you follow? I mean, do you follow much about the governmental policies and the central bank? I know I was trying to see if they were the city or in Bogota, but do you follow much about the local economy here? It's from a from a their, what their debt load is like, the GDP and all the details. Yeah. Well, just very broad stroke. Yeah. I, I did that when I first came here, when I first considered investing. Mm -hmm. Their debt to GDP hovers right around 50%. Mm -hmm. So they've got a lot of upside as far as their ability to raise rates because mm -hmm. they do get a big bout of inflation. Yeah. The pesos very, very cheap against the dollar right now. Mm -hmm. And they've, they've left it that way. They've left rates low. I know when they... Uh, we had a bit of inflation here back in um, maybe 2016, 17, right? And what you'll notice with these smaller economies is they work a lot more like an Austrian textbook. So what I mean by that is like the Austrian guys um, that, you know, if any of you guys watched like Bob Murphy or Tom Woods or mm -hmm. any of those guys, um, the, the prescription that an Austrian would give you if you said, okay, we're going to raise interest rates, what will happen? And bam, 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 bam. Yeah. In, in these smaller economies, that happens like immediately. It's just, it's, it's like clockwork. So yeah. here, as soon as they raise interest, interest rates, the peso, bam, appreciated by you know, 10%, something like that. And, but they have the, the room to do that. And so a lot of people say, well, George, are you really worried about the currency going against you here? Not really because, again, my, 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 I'm in hard assets. So if the currency does go against me, it's, it's most likely going to appreciate the, the assets. are going to go up because of the hedge against inflation. Yeah. And, and if you're not living in the United States, your, your expenses are not denominated in dollars. So it would be the same thing as me saying, Mike, are you worried about what the Turkish lira is doing? <laughs> well, no, I, I could care less. Why? Because your expenses aren't in Turkish lira. Yeah. They're in dollars. So when you're living in Colombia, you get you have a much different outlook on it. But uh, as far as the, the macro stuff, if any of you guys kind of are, are into economics or Austrian economics, you would like the macro numbers for, Colum for Colombia uh, a heck of a lot more than you'd like in the United States. Oh, hands down, <laughs> that, hands that's down. for sure. Yeah. So at this current moment, the exchange rate is 3,300 to one or something like that. And so in my little videos, I try to put the price of everything I, everything I spend or buy. And in this area here, as you mentioned, it's more of the, on an upper scale of things. And 
even with that, it's still you know very favorable. So I couldn't imagine how much cheaper it would get if I was close to the hills. And so you no, know, Gary, even down to the city, you're in an area right here that's just not even a mile square, mm -hmm. maybe a kilometer square, where all the tourists come. So the mm -hmm. prices are going to be like double, triple. Yeah. So so they are on a higher end, but still they are on a higher end, but still cheaper. Like it's, you know, for, for what you would expect. And yeah, so, for sure. Right. Not that, you're, it's very favorable. Yeah. If you just go in, in very nice areas, by the way, I'm not saying you have to go into the ghetto or anything. Mm -hmm. If you just go over into Indigato mm -hmm. or into Sabaneta or some of these little suburbs that are very, very nice. Yeah. I mean, the prices are, are a fraction of what they are even here. Wow. So I've been getting robbed in on this side because <laughs> everything has been yeah, extremely affordable, enjoyably affordable. Like, man, like, yeah, got me thinking a lot. <laughs> Uh, what else we got going on? So, any guy, if you guys have any questions or thoughts, feel free to ask. We're we'll going for a couple more minutes. I just wanted to connect and check in and uh, get some questions answered. If anybody had any, and so question. Oh, here's a good question. Yeah. One thing I have not seen that I haven't seen well in this region here, I haven't seen a lot of Asian presence. Mm. So, from I'm a you know, to Asia or Chinese, the Chinese are everywhere spreading their tentacles in preparation for the new world order, I believe. And so, are they investing? Heavily here, or have you seen anything? Are they buying up a lot of things, or building infrastructure, or helping the government out? Or not so, not so much here, but more so Bogota. Bogota, okay. And what I've seen with the Chinese, wherever I travel in the world, generally when they're coming in and investing, they go to the capital. So, like in Ecuador, I never ever saw them, but you go to Quito, mm -hmm. and you see a ton of Chinese. Mm -hmm. So the, I, they, I can't, I think they prefer to hang out in the, in the capitals. Yeah, and and, and Medellin is in the capitals, Bogota. <laughs> Little blood pressure. What up, guys? Where are the beers? <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was last evening. Today is the water day, <laughs> recovery day. <laughs> oh man! Yeah, my voice is a little hoarse from screaming so much of the live music. <laughs> the ACDC was great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in the next video coming up, I, I'll have a little couple couple clips. Can't go too deep into it, but we had a good time hanging out and got a chance to see some some, some good music. Yeah. Um, so talking about SDRs. So let me ask you your, your, your thoughts on this. With the push now for central bank digital currencies, do you still see the SDR as it's been described prior to this crypto craze world we're in now still being the same uh, escape route for the world governments? Or do you see them merging the SDR or using some type of IMF blockchain, special cause of SDR chain? Do you, what, what do you see? You know, outside of the conventional way, the SDR is supposed to be the savior for all the central banks at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You still see that being the same, or has plans changed based upon all the things you've studied? I think that's a very good question. I think I don't see the IMF going away, mm -hmm. and therefore I don't see the SDR going away. But I do see governments going towards a digital currency it just gives them too much power it gives them too much control and i think it's just the, the the bigger a government becomes the more people who are attracted to power gravitate toward the government and so it's ironic because the bigger the government gets the the more the people you don't want to be in government yeah. are in government and I think that, you know, why would you go into government? I mean, think about what you have to do to be a successful politician. I mean, you have to be morally bankrupt. You have to be fantastic at lying. Uh -huh. You have to have no principles. You have to have no ethical more, uh, North Star. I mean, you just have to be at the, the dregs of society. That, and you're a great politician. Yeah. You'll get, you'll get reelected more yeah. than likely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone who's honest, like Ron Paul. I mean, although he did well, I mean, I think he's, he's definitely an outlier. Mm -hmm. So it, it, my point is that if you if you have those types of people, these sociopaths in government, and, and they it, it dawns on them the power they could have to keep their jobs and to, to, to leverage the, the power that they have through a digital currency, I just, I can't see them resisting that. Yeah. And so I think that will allow them to take rates negative, which would, in their minds, that might uh, give them a little bit of a, a break from being dependent on the SDR. Because how do you have a currency crisis when, when, when your 
forcing everyone to use that currency because they literally have no other option to transact. Even in Venezuela, you, know, you can you can get your money out of the country, you can buy gold or uh, buy gold, or you can buy Bitcoin, or you can do things like that to, to save yourself. But if there was a digital currency, a government-backed digital currency, people all you know, a lot of people say to me, not really uh, your type of viewer, but uh, just kind of your normies. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, the, the dollar's already digital. I, I don't you know, have cash, and they, they don't understand that it, 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 it goes to a whole new level when the government has a, a, a tracking code, mm -hmm. and they can just block it in, in an instant, and then they, they can really guide and direct the demand side of, of the economy. Mm -hmm. So my point is, like in Venezuela now, you can get your wealth or your, your, your purchasing power mm -hmm. out of the country. It's hard. But you can do it with a digital currency. There's absolutely no way, and so they would have the ability to do things that would delay them needing to go to an SDR. But I, I don't see the SDR. So to the IMF. Yeah. So Tony says IMF and World Bank goes away with the AIIB, who has 102 countries signed up for the Silk Road. Yeah. So AIIB and the BRICS and the all the swap agreements and all that stuff, man, is it's being set up, but it's not being talked about in the mainstream. It's 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 well underway. Shanghai Gold Exchange and stuff like that. It's it's all been it's set in place. The question will be: at what point will they flip the switch and cut everything on to where China basically makes an announcement about not no no longer accepting just dollars or whatever, or telling everybody who does business with them we don't take dollars no more. You see that happening in the next. Well, decade, couple of couple of years, or what? Where China says we don't need that no more. We don't want that. If you give us gold or give us this, or we don't well, do business. I mean, I think the the desire of all countries, I think not just China, but uh, all the entire world of using dollars is declining rapidly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see. Um, I, I see that. I see the dollar having less and less demand. I mean, you got to put yourselves in the position of another country. I mean, would you want to be held hostage by the dollar and, and having to go through New York for every single one of your transactions so they could just, at an instant notice, put all these uh, sanctions sanctions on you and then your whole economy <laughs> screwed? And, uh, no, absolutely not. And and the, 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 the U.S. just bullies their way around the entire world and they, and they just have taken advantage of not only the fact that they have the reserve currency, um, but they, they take advantage of the fact that basically all financial transactions have to go through the U.S. so they can block that. And now with FATCA, it, it's just, it, at a certain point, it, if it, it's, it's just human nature. If you keep poking someone, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're going to get pissed yeah. and, and, you're, and they're going to say, you know, I don't want any of this anymore. And so it, the more the U.S. kind of ha the, the more the U.S. institutes those types of tactics, mm -hmm. I think the less demand you're going to have for the dollar. And the people they're looking for solutions. I mean, China is looking for a solution. Russia is looking for a solution. And do you blame them? Mm -hmm. but yeah, I would do the exact same thing. And, and to go even further on that, like they they're not as they're, they've been forced to look for solutions, but yet the sanctions has been have actually turned to be a blessing, I believe, for a lot of those countries because all of the, at least seven of them, Iran, Venezuela, Russia, China, they've all now developed their own payment systems. They, right. they were forced into come up with their own payment systems, which China and Russia apparently they have their own little inter, inter bank exchange and whatnot, and all the dealers there. Iran has a alternative. And France is talking about doing something as well, depending on how this tariff situation pans out. And then, okay, so all those sanctioned nations were forced to speed up the de dollarization process. Yeah. And so, me being able to see that, I realize that the clock is ticking faster now. For sure. Because it looks like to me that they're starting to lose control of their ability to maintain the narrative that everything is fine. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't anticipate Jerome Powell in the next couple of press conferences coming out with that very optimistic, the economy's good. He's going to be a little bit more dialed back with that, pointing out one or two issues perhaps, saying that we now have to implement some new tools or something like that. So I don't know, just looking ahead, but the repo market, you've talked a lot about that, you've done a lot of great videos about that. 
will, will, is this the end of the, is this the beginning of the end as far as the Fed controlling the narrative, or will they just QE until until hyperinflation time? What do you think? I think it's the beginning of the end of them having any control whatsoever, mm-hmm. because the only thing they really can control, or in the past has been, it's been thought that they control the short end of the yield curve. Mm-hmm. That means short-term interest rates, mm-hmm. like the Fed funds rate, and it kind of trickles down from there. So uh, in the last repo blow up on the 17th of September, that took the, the Fed funds rate outside of their target. Most mm-hmm. people don't realize that. They think, oh, it's just kind of business as usual. But it was not business as usual because you had all that capital moving from the where it was in the Fed funds to bring that rate down to where they wanted it. Their target at the time was between, I think, 2 and 2.25 is what that Fed funds rate. And it got up to 2.3 outside of their target mm-hmm. range. So that 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 means the Fed officially lost control of the Fed funds rate. What was the trigger? The, the repo. So what happens is you got two markets right there. Mm-hmm. And if, if it's just like investing. Okay, right? so, so, so if the repo rate goes to 10%. Yeah. Do you want your money at, at 2% or 10%? You're going to move all your money to the 10%. That's going to make the rates go up. Right. In the Fed funds. So how much do you think that has to do with, because that, that all, to me, I, I believe it was, it, was, it was connected with the fact that the LIBOR exchange mechanism basically was shut off or came to an end for all banks and whatnot, and everyone's on their own little payment mechanism or interest rate platform of set, set interest rates. So the SOFR, whatever the SOFR, or whatever the acronym is for, Kicked in at the same time, so it kicked in officially in August. All the banks will be using that mechanism to discover overnight money rates, but yet I think that was it was some type of malfunction in that process. It's going from the international standard of LIBOR to the SOFR, which is that's just for U.S. banks. I think that a part of the spike that happened, which caused the repo meltdown, was due to the fact that that SOFR makes it harder for the two biggest failed banks here. To take advantage of the international rates and manipulate things and profit off of the LIBOR like they've been doing for so long. So that's, that's what I think the trigger was initially, which was reflected in the repo markets. But a lot of those funds, are they going to certain banks or some people say they probably, they're finding their way over to, uh, to Deutsche Bank because of the crisis there. What do you think? So a good chunk of those funds, are they actually going to solve a crisis or are they going just to provide true liquidity to, to companies that have issues? Yeah. So I, I follow a lot of guys who are, are really, really smart when it comes to not just repo, but macro in general. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure a lot of your uh, viewers follow guys like Jeff Snyder, mm-hmm. like Luke Chrome, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, all the guys on Macro Voices and, and Real Vision pretty much. And so what I try to do is just take their ideas and, and process them and understand them to the best of my ability mm-hmm. and then kind of put everything together to come to a conclusion on what I think the most probable reason or outcome will, will be because those guys are a hell of a lot smarter than I'll ever be. So that said, Jeff Snyder's take on it is that it's it's a collateral issue and the, the, the system broke. Now, it, and I like using Jim Rickard's uh, analogy of you've got an avalanche. So it's all this snow. What, what is the exact snowflake that makes it come tumbling down? You don't really know. But it, it's not just that snowflake that triggered it. Mm-hmm. It's all the other snow underneath mm-hmm. that caused the instability. Yes. And I think the repo market is, is probably the same thing. Uh, so going back to Snyder's take, he believes that the whole system broke in 2009 mm-hmm. or during the great financial crisis. Mm-hmm. And back and, and he makes it, it, it's tough to argue with him because back before 2009, if you look at a chart of the Fed, of the uh, excess reserves mm-hmm. in the banking system, and that's the money that, that could go into repo mm-hmm. to, to bring down the rate, the uh, the, the nightly uh, or the average amount of the excess reserves in the entire U.S. banking system was about ten billion dollars. If you average it out, ten billion. Mm-hmm. Right? It, you know what it went to, and uh, it, it's peaked out. At, uh, you know, it goes up the, Fed, the mm-hmm. Fed's uh, balance sheet. It peaked out at like uh, well over two trillion dollars, <laughs> and right now it's at about one point five trillion. So you think about the the, the money markets mm. that we have and the ways that uh, businesses get or entities get dollar funding mm. in this whole system. 
And, and, and you look at the fact that they used to be able to do that with $10 billion, and now they need $1.5 trillion to do that. Yeah. And we haven't had that much inflation <laughs> in the last 10 years. Yeah. So there is something wildly wrong. So Snyder's take is that before the great financial crisis, a lot of the collateral that they used in those repo transactions were, was mortgage-backed securities. Mm-hmm. And, and, and other things, too, that, that we look at now is just toxic waste. You wouldn't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. And he thinks that uh, when the crisis hit, all the banks realized, oh, OK, that, that collateral, we want nothing to do with that. We want zero to do with it. So then it went to a situation where they would only accept U.S. Treasuries. And that was just such a small slice of the collateral pie. Mm-hmm. That the, that the government, even though it's been running just massive deficits, it still hasn't filled the void that was left by the um, banks and the the broker de- the, the the primary dealers mm-hmm. and that everyone in that system just really now shunning the all the garbage collateral that they used to take. So he thinks that was kind of the, the all the snow that was building. To, to form that avalanche mm-hmm. and that's the problem and then it takes it a step further when you add the euro dollar system mm-hmm. into it that takes us down a whole other rabbit hole yeah. but mm-hmm. then, then you combine that with the fact that uh, that there is most likely a, a counterparty risk issue as well mm-hmm. so I don't think it's just that there's that the um, entities who are lending into the repo market mm-hmm. are saying Okay, it's just the fact that there's not enough good collateral. I think that's definitely an issue. But I also think they're looking at that counterparty and saying, uh, "Yeah, I, I don't want to lend to that person, <laughs> to that person. or to that entity. <laughs> call, it, call it Deutsche Bank, yeah. call it uh, HSBC, whatever." And uh, another thing that most people don't realize, even a lot of pros don't realize, is that the although we call it a repurchase agreement, mm-hmm. and, and and back in the day it was something where legally that that entity would buy the collateral and then you would agree to buy it back. So it technically wasn't like an overnight loan or it was a collateralized loan, but they actually changed the law. It went to, Snyder points this out, that it went to, I don't know if it was the Supreme Court or what happened, but so now it's, it's really not a legal transaction. And to make it worse, the collateral doesn't change hands. Okay, so mm-hmm. let's say you and I are, are two banks, yeah. and you say you come into the repo market and say, "Okay, um, I need to borrow a, a billion dollars mm-hmm. for overnight." Yeah. Okay. And I say, "Okay, great. What type of uh, you know, what, yeah? What what, what, is, what do you what do you have for me?" And you've got your uh, your treasury there, and I say, "Okay, well, here's the money." Well, well what used to happen? way, way, way back from what most people think mm-hmm. is that that treasury goes from you to me. So if you default on that loan, well, I've got your treasury, I can sell it out the market. No, that's not what happens. Mm-hmm. It stays with you. Yeah. So all I'm doing is basically giving you the money. So if you go bust, mm-hmm. I most likely won't get that that treasury. To, to, add, and to add fuel to the fire, that treasury that you're putting up as collateral could be rehypothecated. So, exactly. yeah. so it could be someone else's treasury that you're putting up as collateral that you don't even give to me that I don't have any legal right to. Yeah. So is it any surprise that we see yeah. less lending in the repo market when you could potentially have all this counterparty risk? Then mm-hmm. you combine that with the fact that there's a lot less collateral that people or entities see as acceptable. And you got a powder keg, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's not good. So the interconnectedness of this corrupt banking system and all the practices that they put in place have Pretty much drain society. Yeah, they can't contain it no more. That's coming home to roost. They can't That's contain it because like, they don't. They don't trust themselves. Like it's bad. Yeah. You don't trust your your fellow banker. Yeah, and so that's that's dangerous. Yeah, that's very true. dangerous. Yeah, what is it? The honesty among thieves. <laughs> so that's, that's no longer. So here's a question. So so once again, this is like a a chat but talk. So I got questions. So I'm learning myself. So here's something that says, "Hey George, is the rate? This is this is back when we talk about the repo." Sure, sure. Hey George, is the rate if is the rate if the rate got up to ten percent? Mm-hmm. Doesn't that imply the real rate it should be at, given the manipulation and right. therefore the ten-year treasury to be closer to seventeen? <laughs> that's, that's right. I don't know if it's closer to seventeen, but uh, you're you're absolutely spot on. In fact, I, I don't know if 
Paul, if you maybe have seen one of my videos, but if you go to the video that I did, that my channel is just my name, George Gammon, G-A-M-M-O-N. I did a video, um, I believe it was the one that came out Friday, where I actually walked through that. And Luke Groman walks through that as well. It's not just me saying that. I did an interview, and I used clips of mm -hmm. our, our interview, with, or my interview with Groman. And he says that exact same thing, that it's not just that tenure would, would adjust, it's mortgages mm -hmm. would adjust. Every single interest rate out there would be up right at or above 10%. Yeah. That goes back to my point about LIBOR, the, the, that coming to an end and that sulfur being the primary mechanism for setting rates amongst the banking sector impacts everything we do as well, because that's just how we you know, basically borrow ourselves. And so once again, like, it, will it work? Will they be able to get that thing off the ground? Because now the Federal Reserve now is the lender and the beginning and end of everything that they're doing in the, fan, in the banking sector. So where do you see the interest rates going? Do you see us going to negative the next year or two? Or getting close to zero, like below one and touching on like a quarter of a percent interest rate, period. Like, do you see that coming as a way or do you see there being some type of other toolkit they can roll out? Well, are you talking about Fed funds? Or Fed, you Fed funds. On, I mean, that's, that's the all interconnected with this repo madness. So. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to go to zero at some point in time because if you look at the, and I'm, if you put yourself in the shoes of a, a central banker and kind of try to think like they think, they actually believe that in order to prevent or smooth out a recession, you've got to drop interest rates by 500 basis points. So that's 5%. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if we're, if we have the, the, the greatest economy in the world, according to Donald Trump's Twitter feed, and uh, you're at 1.5%, mm -hmm. well, you, how, where are you gonna get your 500 basis points from? So I think the question, like Rick Rule says, it, it's, not a, it's not an if question, mm -hmm. it, it's a when question. Because when we get to the next recession, there is no way that interest rates, sort of the Fed funds, mm -hmm. would be at 5% in order to go down to zero. Yeah. So if it's not at 5%, and they have to lower, in their minds, they have to lower down the 500 basis points, then that takes you into negative. And if they can't go negative, then what will happen is they'll just print enough money to try to make up the difference. So if they can only go down 150 basis points, they'll just plug into their models, okay, how much money do we have to print in order to get the same type of stimulant on the demand side, because they're all Keynesians. Yeah, that um, that we would get from lowering the Fed funds another 350 basis points. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, going to be interesting to see because it's it's in our cards. It's one of the things that it's unavoidable. So it's one of them you can be, you can have wishful thinking. And, and so my thing is, a lot of people can hear this. This is this spells problems for your current financial dealings as well as anything you say you're setting aside for a rainy day. Just a very narrative of compound and, and interest. Like that was really big, a really big selling point for prior generations that you put something, you park it here and they'll take care of it. It'll grow in 20, 30 years. You'll be able to withdraw and live happily ever after. How many do you think there's going to be a lot of happily ever afters for the majority of populations that don't get a hold of this information? No, no, not at all. Because and the reason I say that is not just to be doom and gloom or conspiratorial. It's because there's no free lunch. And if you take things down to its very simplest form purchasing power is productivity mm -hmm. it's not money it's it's not it's not currency it's especially not currency it, it's your productivity so if there's no consumption mm -hmm. without production okay you look at how much the united states has over consumed beyond their ability to produce mm -hmm especially since 1971, since we left the gold standard. And we went on this fiat currency, and because we had the privilege of the world reserve currency, we've been able to keep our, our, our interest rates so low. Think about all the consumption that we've got. I mean, the United States doesn't produce anything, yeah. relatively speaking. Right, look at our budget deficit. <laughs> so uh, you, you walk down the aisles of Target or Walmart, 
and how much of that stuff is produced in the United States? Almost zero, yeah. right? So uh, all of our, well, not say all, but you, what, or another thought experiment would be, okay, let's just say that you took interest rates up to 10%, mm-hmm. like they are here in, to, in, in Columbia for mm-hmm. like a mortgage. Yeah. Think about what would happen to the United States if, if interest rates are at 10%. I mean, think what would happen to housing. Think what would happen to the stock market, the corporate bond market. I mean, think about how much money people would lose in, 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 the, in the sovereign debt market. I mean, it would be complete, it, it would be chaos, it would be catastrophic. It would, there, there are no um, adjectives to describe how bad that would be. So th- my point is that whatever that the level of the U.S. economy would be at let's say ten percent interest rates. Mm-hmm. That's actually the right. That's where it should be based yeah. on its production. Yeah. So at some point, the gap or the delta between the, um, the the level of production of the society as a whole and its level of consumption, mm-hmm. at some point, that's got to that's got to yeah. there's got to be in there, right? So if you've had past generations or last forty years over consumed by this much that means in the future those generations are going to have to under consume by that much or technically or if we get lucky maybe it's going to be an equilibrium so there's really no um i don't see a way long term that the standard of living in the united states doesn't deteriorate and i'm not saying that that we're all living in huts and it's a third world country and I'm not saying that at all because we do have an incredible infrastructure and we do have a, a lot of human capital. We've got a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good things there that, that don't go away, even in a worst case scenario. We're still going to have the roads. We're still going to, and that's a huge, huge benefit. So you can rebuild, but I, I just don't see the standard of living. I see this gradually declining uh, until. I think, I think people will be forced to go back to just the basics of what they need. That's, that's going to be the primary focus, like as opposed to having excess, because you can finance excess right now pretty good. Yeah. Everybody gets new iPhones, you can finance a phone. You can finance your whole lifestyle now. You remove the access to credit as easy as it is now, and you'll find out whatever you can afford now with probably cash or a savings or lack thereof is what yeah. your living standard might be. I think that's a great, that's the easiest way to look at yeah. it. Just look at a country where there's no credit. Mm-hmm. So just go to Colombia, look around outside, that's what the United States should look like. Mm-hmm. Go to, uh, or any country that you guys go to, like a Mexico, that's basically what the United States would look like mm-hmm. if we wouldn't have, wouldn't have had the, um, well, I shouldn't say that because if we wouldn't have had the reserve currency, we probably would have had to do what it takes to increase our productivity. Mm-hmm. We probably would still be making stuff home at home. Yeah, it, it would probably be a lot better. Our economy would probably be far more healthy. So I'm not gonna say we, we, we look like uh, Mexico. But uh, it, but if, if, if it went from, if our level of consumption immediately dropped mm-hmm. down to our level of productivity, yeah, then, then, it, then you probably would look like this. Yeah. So getting back to just the basics is what uh, we're talking about here. Like, yeah. So here in this country, one thing I noticed, or just the travel in general, people, it's more family-centered, mm-hmm. more community-centered. It's less about getting the bells and whistles, all the gadgets, the things, and so that's one thing that we lack in the U.S., which is a big distinction from here and there, it's because here it's about community, family. Like everybody, I, you know, I, I know it, but I don't even have to see it directly in this neighborhood here. But at home, it's every man, every man for themselves. It's cutthroat, competition. Everybody want to outdo each other. And I'm not sure if that's a the, the the bad narrative of the capitalism concept or what. But it's like every man for himself. I think it's the opposite. Sink or swim. Yeah, I think it's actually the opposite. Yeah, I, I think that the. And I, I don't, I mean, I think capitalism is, is the greatest thing we've got going. Mm-hmm. It's not perfect, but it's better than everything else. Yeah. That's for sure. But um, I see it as the, the problem really being the welfare state. Welfare state. Okay. So and the, the, what I mean by that is in the United States, if, if um, I, I won't go into the details, but if you have... A, because car, just cars cost, oh, cars cost 30, 50,000 easily. So whatever, that's yeah. sidetrack, we'll go ahead, sorry. And, <laughs> yeah, so um, if, if you have this welfare state where, where everyone has a backup plan, so you don't really need family mm-hmm. because you've got the government, 
Right. Yeah. Right. So the government substituted so, the needs exactly. of the family. They removed exactly. even when it, when it comes to religion, like you know, giving churches a credit, keeping them from actually getting into the communities. Like I've heard some churches where uh, situations where the government won't allow churches to do certain things for the homeless in California. Like uh, yeah. I think churches, the ideal infrastructure for a church is to get in the community and to help. Absolutely. And so once again, if, if there's you know if they're being discouraged to do that because of them. I think it's a, a some, I heard about a bill or a law being brought before whatever county, whatever, to remove that 5013C yeah, yeah. opportunity if churches open up their doors to the homeless. Yeah, like, that's it's, what, it's like, insane. Like, come on now. It's completely insane. And so the government has, has taken over that role in the U.S. If you're, uh, you know, if you, you're a, a single gal with uh, three kids or whatever, you can go to the government and, and get some form of subsidy there. Right, where if you're in Colombia and you're you, you're a single gal or a single guy with the three kids, you're not going to the government. You're going to the street. Mm -hmm. So, what's your option? Of course, it's going to be family. Yeah. So that's why family. That's one of the reasons why families are so close knit here, and you rely on your family. That is the welfare. Is the family and the church. Yeah. Where in the United States and in all these other countries, the 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 the, the your safety net. Isn't your family? It's not the church. It's the state, and and that that in my opinion is is not good yeah. at all. So I would much prefer to trust in my family mm -hmm. than those politicians we were talking about earlier yeah. that are as, as, as shady as shady can be. Do you follow? So we, we it's almost an hour. So if I give a dial back, we we'll, won't we'll take a break today. Um, do you, are you following the impeachment? Or actually, I'm sorry to ask the questions. I'm going to just get to here because <laughs> I got to ask all the questions. But you guys got any thoughts about the dial back? And, um, and by the way, Patriot, I see him or her on uh, all of my uh, live streams. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you being on, on the live streams as well. It's, it's really, I, I, the support's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here's a question here from Marcel off Periscope. He says, how about entertainment and advertising? Tell us how to live and what we need. So once again, it's according to your, it's according to what you want out of life, in my personal opinion. So there's no right or wrong. It's more so if you know everything around you is about to come to a correction, and there's going to come with that correction will come a lot of pain. But then also, depending on your perspective, it's going to be a lot of opportunity. So it's more so your paradigm at this current point. How do you see the world? If you see the world as a struggle, anticipate more struggle. If you see it as opportunity. Stuff might be crumbling around you, but there's still going to be some, some some jewels around that you can still get a hold of. I think so. That'll be a way of just solving that because there's no 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 go get the, like you know yeah. There's no one answer for this life altering experience that's underway right now. So yeah, yeah that's not too sensitive. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can't. Everyone's an individual and they make their own decisions. I'm not sure, Marcel, what, what you exactly need. But uh, let me tell you a story. Um, I. Let's see when was this? This was right after I retired, so it would have been 2012. I had a place in the golf course in Vegas, and I had I you know, back then I, I used to make a substantial amount of money. So a single guy, you know, so I had all these this artwork and you know, I had the, all the latest uh, uh, audio vision, you know, TVs mm -hmm. and all, all this stuff that, that you imagine, and uh, all these fancy watches and just all that stuff, and um, I remember I, I just had all this stuff and every single time you move, it's just such a pain in the ass and you got to do all this. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm just going to put all this stuff in storage and just keep kind of just the basic stuff that mm -hmm. makes it just 10 times easier. Mm -hmm. And then I went on a trip and I can't remember where I went, but I left about a month mm -hmm. where I, I, I did a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. And so it's just completely outside of mine. And I came back from that trip and I opened up my door, everything was gone. And the first couple seconds, I thought that I actually put it in storage and mm -hmm. forgot that I put it in storage. Mm -hmm. But is it, 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 it then, you know, it so dawns you on open me. the door of your, of your residence and yeah. saw everything gone. And yeah. You got it, it was in storage. No, no, no. I, that's what I thought. Uh -huh. I thought, did I put it in storage? I, man, my memory's getting bad. <laughs> and then it dawned on me uh -huh. that I actually got robbed. Damn. <laughs> and then it stole everything that I, that I had. Yeah. Like, they even stole the bed. I mean, it stole, like, all my expensive <laughs> watches and all that. Oh, but, that's not funny, but, 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 yeah, but, but the but the point that and that I'm uh, making to uh right, right. Marcel yeah. is that I, after about thirty seconds of thinking about it, mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? That's awesome. 
Mm-hmm. That was fantastic because I was just going to put it in storage anyway. Mm-hmm. They saved me a trip, and now I don't even have to pay the two hundred bucks <laughs> in storage. On it. And ever since then, I've just kind of, I've just really. I mean, you could take this uh, this laptop and go in my closet here, and you guys will see that uh, I really don't have more stuff than I could fit in maybe three suitcases. Yeah. And since I've lived that way, mm-hmm. oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I'm about it. It's, it's, it's simple, but it's effective because it keeps you with bare minimum. So your your risk to the emotional attachment of losing a lot of things now is very, very relatively smaller than I imagine that initial shock when you open your door and just a shock of like, you know, because I mean, somebody takes from you, that's personal. And I'm assuming that's emotional attachments, just some items in there that probably came from family, friends. So to, to, to chime into this more, the, the less dependent you are on outside possessions and whatnot, that can also alleviate some of that pain. Yeah. So if there's no particular item that you are fond of, and if, if it's gone, then there's, no, there's it'll hurt. But if there's nothing in particular that you become so attached to that you absolutely need, that'll less that'll lessen the pain for what's currently going on. I believe. Yeah, and you have so much more freedom and flexibility. Yeah. Like if I wanted to go spend six months in um, in uh, South Africa or, or Croatia, mm-hmm. a place where I, I really like spending time, mm-hmm. it's easy. Just I'm um, I could literally pack in a, a, an hour, yeah. go to the airport, and spend six months there, and you don't even have to worry about it. And so it, it goes from you know having a lot of material things mm-hmm. to really just uh, placing a higher emphasis on flexibility, freedom. And then actually experiences mm-hmm. of, of seeing things out in the world, becoming a, a better person and meeting more people. Yeah. And um, I, I prefer that. Now, yeah. is that right for everyone? Probably not, but that's what I prefer. Okay. I would agree with you. I would disagree with you. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I believe everyone needs to, this goes to my the other channel, uh, Gift of Rules, I'm sorry, to start it, whatever, where a part of me coming here was also to connect. I, I, this opportunity everywhere I go because I cre- I look for ways to create opportunity for myself as well as add value to other people. And so a part of this is I'm getting a new experience. New experiences expand your awareness. Your awareness is expanded. You, you want bigger and greater. The yeah. problem is in the U.S. especially as, as the, big, the big brother government, as you mentioned earlier, as that grows, they put such a uh, such a hold on your life to where you're now chasing a dollar for the bare minimum or, or, or whatever that standard is for yourself that you get emotionally attached, trapping yourself into that system and not looking for experiences. I believe life, the great, this is just me speaking, coming from the sports world, my greatest and most fondest memories are the experiences I've had with my teammates and going to foreign lands, walking down the street where I don't know where I'm going. That's priceless yeah, really. to me. So anyway, I'm going to start preaching, but Let's get ready to dive back. You ready to put your dollars back? Because we can go forever. So I'm enjoying myself. But um, and thanks for being here, guys. It looks like there's is that many people? We got 96 so far. That's awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys uh, taking time out of your day to spend some time with us. Yeah, exactly. So if you've enjoyed the back and forth, don't be afraid to donate a thumbs up beneath this video. Or if yeah. you didn't like it, thumbs down. I welcome both. <laughs> Whatever it works for you. I'm, like I mentioned like, last night, I'm, I don't care. I'm, I can't say I don't care. But I'm at a point where I've been preaching this and saying this similar subject matter for so long. Yeah. I want to talk about new experiences. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm like, yeah, whatever you want to do, do it. But uh, but I enjoy hanging out with everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. And uh, thank you for welcoming me in your home and things like that. So uh, that being the case, back at it again. Got a couple more vlogs I'm going to put out there. But other than that, uh, leave a comment down below and I'll try to get some questions or shoot the majority have an answer or whatever uh, before time moves on. But be blessed and safe. See you guys later. Peace. Bye.